So we are still dealing with verses 29 through 30, and we will be there for a while <laughs> yet. But we're looking at this business of an effective call and what an effective call is. And last week we looked at Romans chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, and we were looking at the word and it meant to call into being or to bring into existence. Uh, is, is this one meaning of the word call, and we're going to look at another passage today in Romans chapter 9. So let's read our passage first. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And whom he predestined, these also, he also called, and whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. So we're looking at this, and of course Abraham is the outstanding illustration in the Bible of justification by faith. He is the perfect example of this in scripture, of, of justification by faith. And as we look at this, in chapter 9, let's turn to chapter 9 of Romans, and we're starting with verse 6, but it says, But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Neither are, all, they, all, are they all children, because they are Abraham's descendants, but through Isaac your descendants will be named or called. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. For this is a word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And so we're going to look at uh, these verses first and then we'll look at the other examples. So when Paul deals with his kinsmen whom he loves very much, even though they hate him. He has a longing and a passion for them to be saved. So when he looks at his kinsmen, he knows how to argue with them. And he uses their own tactics back on them. And so he is using Abraham and Isaac, and then he'll use Jacob and Esau as illustrations of what he is saying. Because basically what is happening when you understand chapter 9's relationship to chapter 8, the end of chapter 8 is, you're telling me that I have absolute certainty of salvation. I have been foreknown, predestined, called, justified, and glorified. Well, what about us? That's the Jew talking. What about us? Hasn't God's promises failed? See, that's the question that Paul is addressing here, as to whether or not the promises had failed. And what is Paul saying? They have not failed because, in verse 6, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. In other words, in this election of God, we have a broad election, and we have an election within an election, is what Paul is bringing out in this passage. So, they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. And that means that not everyone uh, who belongs to the visible, external, organized church are not of necessity in the church of God and truly members of the body of Christ. And that's the thing we need to realize. The principle that the Bible is bringing out in these passages is that there is a visible church and there is an invisible church. Too often we get hung up and we are only looking at what? The visible church. 
always remember something about the visible church. It's made up of a mixed multitude. Go back to Egypt. And guess who was accompanying Israel out of Egypt? A mixed multitude. In other words, even then, they were not all of Israel. See, and this is what is a, is a very strong biblical principle. In other words, we have 7 million Seventh-day Adventists around the world. That doesn't mean that all 17 million are in Christ at all. See, there's a church that we see and there's a church that God sees. And there's a big difference in these churches. The church that God sees, there's no tares in that church. The church that we see is a mixed multitude. There's tares in that church. See? And, and this is how it works <laughs> that the Bible is bringing out here. So what Paul is bringing out here to, to give us an example is that he is, he has, he's using the word seed and the word children. And the word seed in the Greek is sperma, from which we get our word sperm. And the word children is techna. By the way, the word techna is never used in relationship to Jesus Christ, ever. It's all, the word that's used in relationship to Jesus Christ is ho hoios, son of God, son of man. But never is he ever referred to as a child of God or children of God. There's a big distinction made there in these words. So the word techna is dealing with human beings, descendants of human beings when you're talking about children. So there's a natural sense that the word is used for seed, and there is a spiritual sense that the word is used for seed. And Paul is using the same words to convey both ideas in these passages on this. So he says in, in verse 7, they are, neither are they all children because they are Abraham's seed, but through Isaac your seed will be called. See, this is what he's bringing out a difference, a distinction there between the two seeds. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as the seed or the sperma. So this is what Paul is bringing out here. He's making that distinction that there is the natural seed and there is the spiritual seed that he's bringing out. And he's making a distinction between the two. So Abraham had what? He had an awful lot of children by the time it was all said and done. He started with who? He started with Ishmael. And they became the, uh, the Arab, you know, basically the Arab race. And, and also Keturah. When he married Keturah, there was a whole bunch of kids that Keturah had. And one of those uh, a son's was named Midian. And that also, Midian settled all the way down the Arabia Peninsula. This is where Midian settled. And that is where Moses went when he fled Egypt. He went to Midian, which was part of his kinsmen. Whether you realize that or not, it was part of his family. In other words, when he was going there to escape uh, Pharaoh at that point. We will get to that, yes, because that is a distinction that we need to see here. Uh, and, and the real important thing is what I want to really see in this passage. We're going back to Romans 4, 
God calls those things which are not as if they are. Same word is being used here in Romans 9. So what? <laughs> I'm not an English professor. <laughs> so, so we need to understand what he's trying to do is not that just because you are Israel doesn't necessarily mean that you are Israel is what he's trying to get across here. In other words, you can be a seed of the natural or the flesh, Israel, or you can be a seed spiritual of Israel, see. By the way, whether we understand this or not right now, but Israel is the church. And it's always been the church. And God has always had one way of saving people. And no one is saved apart from being an Israelite. Nobody is saved apart from being an Israelite. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The church is the remnant. Absolutely. Um, the biblical definition for the remnant is those who are loyal to God, to Jesus Christ. Salvation by faith alone. Those are the remnant people. And that has always been the remnant through history. Like I mentioned before, they are the loyalist party. In other words, they cannot be shaken. They cannot be moved in times of persecution and trial and tribulation. That's, that's always been the remnant. The thing we're going to see about this remnant is that God produces the remnant... He creates the remnant, and he maintains the remnant. It has nothing to do with us, period. He does this all by himself. Has nothing to do with our character, period, when he produces this. And we're going to see this this morning here in this passage in Romans 9. It, what happened here with Abraham's children and uh, Isaac and Ishmael, the difference there. By the way, when we're looking at this, this has nothing to do with individual salvation. And this is where so many people have gotten chapter 9 through 11 wrong in Romans. They have made it as a individual salvation matter. It has nothing to do with individual salvation. It has to do with salvation history. In other words, what line was salvation coming through? Yes. Absolutely. And it was it had nothing to do with humanity at all. It was God's sovereign decision as to which line it was going to come through. And a lot of people think, well, you know, Jacob had to have some special characteristics. Oh, Isaac must have had... Some. No. Paul says no. Period. Paul says no. There's nothing to do with those individuals as to whether they were better or worse or whatever. Like I've mentioned before, Isaac and Ishmael were both rascals. Jacob and Esau were both rascals when you study their history. So it had nothing to do with the character of these individuals. That's the thing we need to understand. So when the Bible does teach about God's sovereignty, it's talking about God's sovereignty. And basically God's sovereignty is the way that salvation was to what? was to come. That is sovereign. The line 
as to how salvation was to come to mankind, was sovereign. And the remnant is sovereign. into the world. Yes, yes. In other words, how God was going to bring this, this is all was from the very uh, outset, from, from eternity. He had predetermined, he had predestinated how this was going to take place. And he did the choosing, he did the electing, is what scripture is bringing out here. He is the one that is doing the choosing and the electing. And that's why I'm saying this is not dealing with individual salvation at this point. It's dealing with the line, the history of how it was going to come down through mankind. Yes. No. This is what has caused the major problem in Christendom and as F.F. F. Bruce, a world-known uh, Christian uh, theologian, mentioned, he's passed away now, but he mentioned that when this doctrine was first started to study way back in Augustine's time, somebody jumped the gun way too quick when they were evaluating this argument and they had focused it entirely upon the focus of the individual on that. And they made it look like that God was completely arbitrary, completely arbitrary, and I will choose Mark, I will reject Pat, and you know, and that type of thing, see. And that is not what's being taught here in Scripture at all. Nobody is ever lost because of non-election. Nobody is ever lost because he was not saved. See? And then man's responsibility comes in this picture, see? When it gets down to individual acceptance of this. This is where man's responsibility comes in. But what Paul is trying to do here, he is showing that God's promises never did fail. See, the Jews are asking the question, well, it looks like God messed up somewhere because we're not in. We're out. Why? See, didn't he mess up? Didn't he fail? And Paul is saying, no, you failed because you failed to re recognize and understand what constitutes Israel. And you failed to understand how God was going to save mankind, which was by grace alone, by faith alone, and nothing else. And this is where they fail to understand those two things very clearly. So what he's bringing out here is he's saying that um, neither are they all children because they are Abraham's seed, but through Isaac your descendants will be named or called and the word there that is being used is the same idea as Romans 4 16 and 17 and it means to be called into being called into being in other words God produces his own children he produces his own children. That's why we're associating this with effective calling in Romans 8 here. About the yes, same thing. Yes. So he is the one that calls us into being. And the reason why, now you notice that Paul doesn't deal with the topic of predestination until well over halfway through chapter 8 of Romans. There's a reason why he doesn't deal with it until then. What does he do? He deals with sin. He deals with the gospel. He deals with justification by faith alone. 
he deals with the in Christ motif, the in Christ idea. He deals with the law and he deals with the Holy Spirit. By the time you get to this section in chapter 8, you either know or you don't know if you're in or out. And by that time, you can, you can, you can stomach predestination. You can take it. Before that, you can't take it. See, this is a teaching that you never teach uh, a, a, a novice. You never teach a novice this subject because they won't be able to comprehend it. It will actually do more damage than good for them to, to try to figure that out. In other words, so he shows you if you are in, is how he is doing this all the way. He's weaving that through in the letter of Romans. Because the Bible makes it very clear, you, do, you can know if you are the elect. If you are part of the elect. It's very clear there on that. So he's using this phrase again just to call them into existence. Now notice what he brings out here about uh, Abraham. <clears throat> now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abraham, Behold now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go in to my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abraham listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abraham had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went in to Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to you to, to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between me and mean between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son and you shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has listened to your affliction he shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, and he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So, did Ishmael have a blessing? Certainly. Does that mean that Ishmael, because he was not in the line, was lost? No. That's the thing we need to understand. That's why this distinction is being made. Um, and God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall call her name, uh, not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old bear a child and Abraham said to God oh that Ishmael might live before you God said no but Sarah your wife shall bear you a son and you shall call his name Isaac I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him as for Ishmael I have heard you behold I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly he shall father twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation, but I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. And you notice there that 
Who is making the decision? God is making the decision. Abraham, what was Abraham's choice? Why can't Ishmael be? Because you've got to realize by then Ishmael, I mean, uh, Abraham loved Ishmael. And Ishmael is his firstborn, his first son that he's had. And so he loved Ishmael and he was asking God if, why can't Ishmael be? The promise. See. But Ishmael was 100% what? Natural birth. 100% natural birth. So he couldn't be the promise. The promise couldn't go through him because he was 100% natural birth. He was of what? Of the flesh. He was of the flesh. And God had told Abraham, I am going to what? Give you a child who is the promise, and his name shall be Isaac. See, And this was God's sovereignty there, that he was making that decision. In other words, God had already chosen in his sovereignty which line the blessing uh, of the Messiah was going to come through, or the salvation of the world would come through this one line. Yes. Yes, yes. In fact, Ishmael figured that it was going to be his. No, and he was the eldest child. He was the eldest, and it always fell to the eldest in, in the line. So this was the fact. And you have to always remember that Isaac and Ishmael were brothers. They were, they were family. They were blood. It's another thing we need to, as far as natural descent went. They were blood. They were brothers. They just had different mothers. Was the difference uh, in the in the situation on that? So God is saying it's going to be through this one line that the promise is going to come, and only through this line that the promise is going to come, and that is through uh, Isaac is what he's bringing out. So if you look up these words, you will find that the same word used in verse seven and in verse eleven. And as the authorities say very rightly, it is a word that can be used in one of two senses. It can be reckoned or called, or it can be used in the sense of vocation, which is to call into being, is what Paul is using it here. And so in chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure. See, in other words, my hope is on God's sovereignty. That's the thing we need to realize, what this passage is bringing out. Our hope, our only hope, the only hope we have is in God's sovereignty. And this is what Paul is bringing out in chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. And this is what he's bringing out here in chapter 9, is this is based on God's sovereignty, or his plan, or his purpose. See, this is where our hope lies. In other words, if it wasn't God's sovereignty, it would not be sure to all the sea. Neither would it stand firm or steadfast if it wasn't for God's sovereignty. In other words, God is the one that is bringing this all together. See, we always like to put our little selves in here with our free will in this picture. And when we do that, 
If you're looking at your free will for your hope, folks, you are not going to make it. That's your hope, is in your free will. Our hope is in what God is doing and in his purpose and in his plan. Sometimes uh, we've gotten, to, we've been called Plagian and semi-Plagian. Because our emphasis has been on what? It swung all the way to free will or man's responsibility. Remember, this is always a balance in the Bible. God's sovereignty, man's responsibility, there's a balance there. Not these extremes see, that we see. But the plan of salvation is his. The meaning of the word called here is not merely des uh, a merely designated or reckoning, it means to call into being. Call, God calls into being those things which are not as though they were. In other words, he is the creator. He speaks of things which are non-existent as if they were existent. That is his way of showing that he's going to bring them into existence. In other words, he is going to call them into existence. But it is but at the very minimum, we must take these two meanings into consideration. It is not merely the name that is going to be carried on by Isaac and his seed. It is more than that. In Isaac shall thy seed be called into being. In other words, it will be produced through Isaac, not through Ishmael. We need to make this point even at this stage because what follows really only has true meaning if we attach this particular sense of vocation to the word called here at the end of verse 7. So if you like, you can put it like this. In Isaac shall your seed be brought into being and reckoned and named. Is what Paul is bringing out here. So... That which are of the children of the flesh are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Now then, that is reckoned or counted. So the thing that is being put out here is that this word actually really means produced or called into being. So then the point that is emphasized in verse 7 is that God's choice and call, it's God's choice and calling that matters. It is God who determines in which of the two, Ishmael and Isaac, the seed is to be carried on and the great purpose is to be brought to pass. He's the one that makes that decision. And he makes that decision apart from the players involved in that. The, our character has nothing to do with that decision when he made that decision on that. Remember, this is not talking about individual salvation. It's talking about salvation history. In other words, the line, the way, the path in which God designed that this was to be carried out or brought out uh, for Christ to be the Savior of the world. So it was not Abraham's choice. We, we already read this, the evidence of this. In other words, Abraham would have chosen Ishmael. And God said, no, that is not what I've told you all these years. I am going to produce a child, is what God was promising Abraham, that he was going to produce a child. He tells Abraham the lesser blessing that is going to be given to him, but Abraham, if he had his way, would have seen to it that this great blessing and the promise and the covenant should have come down not through Isaac, but through Ishmael. So the natural seed is they were both born of natural seed in one sense. They were both born of the flesh in one sense. But there was a difference there. And it brings out that at this time, I will come and Sarah shall have what? A child, a son. In other words, when God came, Abraham and Sarah were both dead as far as producing children went. 
They were both dead as far as producing children went. So when God came, God worked through the natural method, but what did he have to do? He had to regenerate Abraham and Sarah. He had to call them back from the dead so that they could have a child. So in reality, what was God doing there? God was literally himself producing the child, is what he was doing. He was literally himself producing the child. In other words, this is what the promise is all about. It's God who what? Makes the promise. Remember the difference between the Old and the New Covenant? The Old Covenant is we fulfill the promises. That's the Old Covenant. In other words, all that you say, we will do. In the New Covenant, who fulfills the promises? God fulfills the promises in the new covenant. This is what he's revealing here all the way through in these passages is that he is the one that is going to fulfill these promises, not us. They're not dependent upon us. And that's the thing we have to understand of what he's trying to do here on this passage. So in summary, it says number one is that the promise was made respect to Isaac not only before he was born, but even before he was conceived in the womb. Number two, the child Isaac was born because of the promise. The promise was not given because of the child, because the child was born, but the child was born because the promise was given. Let me read that again. The promise was not given because the child was born. The, pro the child was born because the promise was given. In other words, God produced the child. Number three, Isaac is something more than the son of Abraham. He is the son of Abraham. Abraham produced uh, Isaac, but also in a sense he did not because Isaac is really produced by the promise. In other words, God had to come in and do what? He had to come in and perform a miracle that had to take place there. Uh, yes. Yes. It's, yes. 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 They are. Yes. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And that's another thing you've got to realize is that uh, we're looking at, you know, that Jesus Christ is the electing God. And he is also the elected man. So all predestination as far as salvation is concerned is in him and in him alone. Because he is the new humanity. Yes, he is the new Israel. 
He is the new humanity. He's the new human race. You see, when Christ died on that cross, he died the second death, is what he died. And when he came up out of that grave and ascended to heaven, he didn't come up as the old man. He came up as the new man, the new humanity, completely and entirely cleansed from sin. And that's how he entered into the heavenly sanctuary. No sin gets in there, see, because he is the new humanity. Yes, yes that's the... Yes, it was Christ. Galatians 3.16. That is the thing. It's not seeds, plural. It is seed, singular. And you'll notice how God always he created the remnant. He maintains the remnant. Yes, yes. He and he maintains the remnant. In other words, the remnant never maintains itself. The men, remnant never would have existed if God hadn't created it in the first place. So the remnant is God's child. That's the thing we need to realize about this. Yes, God does that always. So it is God who produced Isaac in order that his promise might be carried out. That's the only guarantee that we have, folks. If you are asking yourself the question, and you're my age, 71 or older, and you're asking yourself the question, am I really safe to save? Am I perfect? If I'm, if, am I sinless? I'm going to ask you, how's that working for you? You don't have very much more time left. Because if you're trusting in any of those kind of things, you are trusting in the wrong things because there's no hope in any of that. The hope is entirely and completely in God fulfilling his purpose and his promise alone. That is the only thing. That's why uh, in one uh, book it mentions that only the only way that sin will never rise up a second time is because God guarantees that it will not rise up again a second time. Not us. And where did he guarantee that? On Calvary. That's where he guaranteed that it would never rise up again a second time. Jesus Christ is the guarantee. <laughs> 
but this will never rise up again. That's my hope, folks. Never in here. That's the thing we need to see. Yes. Yes. That's what he did. Number four, it is God's, is that God elected Isaac as the seed and produced him because he had elected him. Is that clear to you? God had chosen Isaac to be the one through whom his, this covenant and promise were to be worked out. Because he had decided on that, he then acted and worked his miracle. And so Isaac was born to Sarah and Abraham as his father. It is the election of Isaac that comes first. The production is something that follows. He does not elect him, in, in other words, after he has arrived. That is the teaching. So we, we're mind, our mind is so focused on that the election takes place afterwards, see? After we can show something good in us, see? And all that kind of thing. Uh, no, the election takes place before the birth takes place. Yes, for the foundation of the world. Number five, Isaac then, we can say, is really born of the Spirit. He is born of the Spirit. You can find this in Galatians chapter 4, starting with verse 22 to the end of the chapter. But he is born after the Spirit. Number six, nothing matters in connection with this except the spiritual birth. And that spiritual birth is always of God. It is never of the flesh. The case of Isaac proves it. Abraham and Sarah, as we have seen, could not produce Isaac. It was God who produced him. He is born of the Spirit, and this spiritual birth is always of God. This is the effective calling. If the calling is effectual to you, it is because God has produced it and made it effective. To you. You can't do this of yourself. You can't call yourself. You cannot birth yourself. First time or second time. God is the one that does this entirely. So this effectual calling is produced by God himself, not by us on that. And in Galatians 4, it is always something that is determined beforehand, even before we are born. It depends upon nothing in us in any shape or form, but it is entirely God's determination and God's production. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Galatians 1, 15 and 16. Natural descent is not the thing that matters. The thing that matters is that we are born of the promise, born of the Spirit. Yes. Yes. If you are uh, Christ, you are Abraham's seed. Exactly. And that's the thing we need to realize. So this was always the plan. This was always the purpose all the way through history. Israel is his church, and none become uh, unless they are of Israel. See, But it's the Israel within Israel is what the Bible is bringing out. And the true Israel, the spiritual Israel, is made up of all Jews that believe and all Gentiles that believe. So this choice with Ishmael and Isaac had nothing to do with their personal salvation. This choice with Esau and Jacob had nothing to do with their personal salvation at that point. It was that it was God was uh, sovereignly choosing the line in which salvation would come through in history. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, I believe that Hagar had already accepted that. 
when God came to her the second time with the covenant. I believe that she had accepted that at that time. You've got to realize that the, the Arab nations originally came, where, came from where? They came from Abraham. Whose training had they received in, the, in that house? Abraham's training. Who, what God did they worship at that time? Yahweh. And they probably worshiped Yahweh for uh, many generations thereafter until finally, you know, because you have to realize Esau, who did Esau marry? He went over to Canaan and married the daughters of Canaan. And then the decline started to come in there. But originally these people were worshipers of Yahweh and we need to realize that about them and that's one of the reasons why Moses when he was escaping Egypt went to his own countrymen they were still part of uh, the family see there in that aspect <clears throat> so natural descent is not the thing that matters the thing that matters is that we are born of the promise born of the spirit God's purpose applies to and is worked out only in those who are born from above, born again, born of God. The natural man must not come in at all. God brought Isaac into being by his own action in order that his promise might be carried out in him and through him. At the, at the season I will come, the children of promise, produced by the promise, born of the promise, not of the flesh, and these and these alone are the seed. So when God effectively calls you, something happens, a miracle happens, and you are what? You are born again, born anew, born from above. It is a miracle. It has nothing to do with you or I at all. It's a miracle that takes place there. The only thing that happens in us, if the call is effective, is we have stopped what? Resisting. Resisting his love, his mercy, and so forth. And that's the effective call. It is, it is God that is producing that. You do not believe apart from God's gift of belief. You do not repent apart from God's gift of repentance. You do not confess your sins apart from God's gift of confession. And that stays with you the rest of your life in, in Christ. It is God that brings you to repentance when you need to repent. It is God that brings you to confession when you need to confess. It always follows through that. It's God that is doing this. God is always maintaining your salvation. You do not maintain your salvation. He is the one that is doing this and accomplishing this. Uh, we are out of time. I wanted to touch on Jacob and Esau, but the characteristic there is, is remember that it was not of works. Anything that Jacob or Esau did whatsoever, that was not even involved choice was made before they ever came into being. God chose who was going to be the line at that point on that so that it would be not of works, but of what? Of grace. Now notice verse 14 and 15. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. And in God's sovereignty, what did he choose to do? He chose to have mercy on all chose to have mercy on all. Romans 11, verse 32. In other words, he locked us all up under condemnation in Adam so that he could have mercy on everyone.
is what Paul tells us in Romans 11:32. there. So, in closing, and his argument is the same here, if it depended upon anything in us, if our salvation and our ultimate glorification at any point or in any way were dependent upon us or upon anything that we have done or ever can do or will do, it would certainly fail. But says Paul, it does not depend on us in order that the purpose of God according to election might stand. Again, this is the promise. In other words, it stands because of God's election. See, the purpose, the plan stands because of God's election. And that's our surety. It is, it is entirely an independent action of God and it works like this because this is the only way in which we can be certain and sure that we are going to be finally glorified. So what guarantees it to every single member of this family of God is that it is God who is working it out and it is entirely the result of the free sovereign action of Almighty God. That is what Paul has been proving by these two cases that he's representing here in channel nine, uh, in, excuse me, in chapter nine. <laughs> okay, our time is up, and so next week we are going to look at, you know, have I been called? We're going to look and see how we can tell whether we've been called or not, effectively called or not. Everybody is called, but only those who do not resist are effectively called and that's the thing we need to realize on on the what Paul is bringing out here there has to be a response that is given on this calling and uh, that is man's responsibility man's part in that is is accepting what God has done uh, in the plan of salvation so next week we'll be looking at that now when we get to Romans 9 when we eventually get there we will go into more detail on these things about this, these three chapters, how this all works out together. Because it is the salvation line of history that is mainly being talked about in these chapters and not individual salvation. Uh, let's bow our heads as we close. Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful good news of the gospel and that you call us into being. You call those things which are not as though they are and were and we just thank you and praise you in jesus name for that and that you have called us into your wonderful love and into your wonderful grace and into your wonderful salvation in jesus name amen